This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. The pencil engraving of the errant knight of La Mancha tilting at windmills with his portly squire astride a donkey is one of the most enduring images in the popular imagination. However, the image belies the fantastical, complex and sophisticated story on which it's based. Four hundred years ago, Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote was published in Madrid. It was an immediate success and has been recognised as one of the classic texts of Western literature, revered by writers such as Stern, Goethe, Flaubert, Dickens, Dostoevsky, Kafka and Melville. Don Quixote tells the story of an unlikely hero, an impoverished country gentleman goes mad from reading too much and decides to put the world to rights by becoming a knight-errant. The novel is based on his delusional, chivalric ideas which bump against the reality of his more earthbound companion, Sancho Panza. So, how has the book endured over the centuries? What was the relationship between Cervantes' work and the world of 17th century Spain in which he lived? And can it live up to the claim that it was the first European novel? With me to discuss Don Quixote, as the English have always called it, are Edwin Williamson, Professor of Spanish Studies at the University of Oxford, Barry Ive, Cervantes Professor Emeritus at King's College London, and Jane Wetnall, Senior Lecturer in Hispanic Studies at Queen Mary's University of London. Barry Ive, Barry Ive, um, the 16th century Spain was called the Golden Age. This book uh, comes in just at the beginning of the 17th century. Was there a sense when, uh, Cervant- when Cervantes was writing that the that, 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 that power and glory had tilted away from Spain? I think we're at a, a pivotal point, though there's still some way to go before uh, Spain enters its period of so-called terminal decline. Uh, the Golden Age is a, is a term that historians coined quite a while after the period that we're talking about. Uh, if, if Spaniards talked about the Golden Age in the 16th century, they were referring to Horace and Ovid, uh, the classical Golden Age. The Siglo de Oro um, tends to be, that term tends to be used rather differently, uh, whether you're a political historian or a cultural historian. Political historians of Spain tend to start the, the Golden Age, as it were, right back in the 15th century, the last quarter of the 15th yeah, century. But we're talking about a time when Spain had a tremendous empire yeah. uh, over in the, the Americas, let's call it. It was a not dominating power in Europe, massively powerful, the great protagonist for Christianity, but for a, but for a non-following wind and the heroics of the British, it would have taken over the yeah, British Isles uh, at the Armada. Uh, and so you had much loot and treasure uh, 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 among that, uh, th- that people. All of those things. It, it's been very, very powerful outside uh, the peninsula, very problematic inside the peninsula. Uh, Lots of uh, social tension between new Christians and old Christians, Uh, the wealth fueling the rise of the the new aristocracy, creating another kind of social tension. And all of that beginning to come to the boil towards the end of the 16th century when the mood perceptively changes. uh, Spain gets a rather bloody nose in 1588 with the failure of the Armada, there's a big plague in, in Castile uh, right at the end of the, of the century. And the mood is, is changing, uh, and out of that arises a generation of writers, I mean, essentially six major writers, three major da- dramatists, Lope Tirso and Calderon, uh, two poets, uh, Gonger and Quevedo, and, and Cervantes, the, the major prose writer of the period. And they all take, they all have in common a kind of problematic attitude towards the relationship between Spanish past and present. One of the golden ages we think about in Spain now is a couple of hundred years earlier, say, with Cordoba and Seville, where the Jews, the the Muslims and the Christians lived alongside each other. We can use alongside, I think, without without too much... The Spaniards call it convivencia. And the um, the Jews, by this, by the time we come to this, the Jews had been expelled, the Mm -hmm. Moors had been forced to turn Christian, Mm -hmm. uh, become Moriscos, and they were in danger of being pushed out Mm -hmm. as well. Is this working into uh, Cervantes... uh, Obviously, he knows all about this. Is this working into his thoughts? Uh, well, well all, all of those things. Are, different ages tend to read Cervantes in different ways, mm. and it's very noticeable that you know, at the beginning of the 21st century, we're picking up on some of the anxieties of our own age, I mean, particularly mm. relationship mm-hmm. between Christendom and, and Islam. Uh, and that's, that's inevitably there in the book, because it was, uh, the, the Muslims were a major minority uh, group within, within uh, Spain, um, even the you know, third and fourth generation um, uh, com- uh, conversos and moriscos. Uh, 
uh, still represent uh, a, a problem to the authorities, to the power, the hegemony um, uh, I- I inside Spain. That's all there. I mean, and whether it's foregrounded quite to the extent that we perhaps like to see it today, I, I, I rather doubt. All right. It's Edwin, there in the background, certainly. Sorry. Mm. Edwin Nelson, what do we know about Cervantes' life? Well, we know... Um, quite a bit more than we'd know about Shakespeare, for example, but not uh, that much. I mean, there are gaps, but um, uh, his life conventionally is divided, has been divided into two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, a life of um, a man of action. He was a soldier. He was uh, a hero in battle. Um, and the second part, roughly, uh, is one of penury and failure. Uh, he was born in 1547 in Alcalá de Henares, which was a university town some 20 or 30 miles from Madrid. He was born uh, the son of a barber surgeon, so his father didn't have a very eminent profession, and the family was uh, always uh, strapped for cash and kept moving about. His school education we know very little about, but it's possible that he was educated in Cordoba at a Jesuit school, and then he turns up in his late teens in Madrid at the academy run by Juan López de Hoyos, who was an Erasmian humanist, but shortly after that, in 1569, I think it was, he uh, goes to Rome and enters the service of Cardinal uh, Aquaviva. Um, about a year or two after that, he goes down to Naples and lists in a Spanish regiment and uh, takes part in a series of um, military engagements, the greatest of which was the Battle of Lepanto of 1571. Now, this was a great victory for the Christian forces led by Don John of Austria, Philip II's half-brother, and it turned uh, the tide uh, of the Ottoman advance in the Mediterranean. Cervantes was very proud of his action there because he um, was wounded and lost the, the use of his left hand. And he, for the rest of his life, he saw that as a badge of courage, a badge of honor. He, he, uh, then in 1575, he was uh, sailing back to Spain with his brother, Rodrigo, and they were captured by Barbary pirates, Muslim pirates, and taken as slaves, sold into slavery in Algiers. He spent five years in Algiers, and even there, his um, heroism was undimmed. He organized, uh, became the ringleader, in fact, of at least four escape attempts. Finally, he was ransomed and returned to Spain in 1580. And this is when uh, the second part of his life starts, when he slides into uh, failure, frustration, and impoverishment. Um, he tries to become a dramatist and fails. Um, he publishes his first book in 1585, a pastoral romance called La Galatea, and that doesn't do too well either. At this stage, he becomes involved in love affairs. We don't know very much about his love life, but um, in the early 1580s, he becomes involved with a young married woman and has an illegitimate daughter, Isabel, but shortly after that, very shortly after that, he marries an 18-year-old girl, Catalina de Salazar, and um, they don't have any children, and uh, conventionally it's thought that it wasn't a very happy marriage because they seemed to spend very little time together. He, went, he, he was making a living <coughs> as a tax collector, and he got, he got nabbed for that, didn't he? Well, that comes a bit later on. Uh, in fact, in the 1580s, he's actually a commissary for the Crown, yeah. requisitioning provisions for the invincible armada against England. Yeah. And in 1590, he tries to... I think he probably got fed up and wanted to give up the idea of becoming a writer. So he petitions the Council of the Indies for a post in America, and he gets turned down, which is a bit of disappointment to him. Yeah. And in the 1590s, he does become a tax collector, which was really a very humble, itinerant sort of um, profession to follow. And he wanders around Andalusia, obviously staying in roadside inns, which might have fed into Don Quixote, where the mm. inns play quite an important part. He gets... Uh, put into jail at least twice for alleged irregularities in his accounting. Um, he, um, he generally is, 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 is a failure. That's a, a brilliant, uh, uh, and, uh, given that you spent years on this subject, brilliant, uh, succinct um, uh, biography. It's wonderfully unlike the biography of almost any writer you ever read about, isn't it? But right. what were, <laughs> if he had literary precedents, because then we're coming on to the writing of the great book, what were his literary precedents? What was he reading? I've, I said in the introduction that, uh, I think it was the trailer, I can't remember which, uh, he, he read massively. What was, what was the massively he was reading? Well, I... Th 
he never, as far as we know, he never went to university. He may have acquired some humanistic education at this academy of Lopez de Hoyos, but he did spend six years in Italy. And there he was very struck by um, the Italian classics. He, um, and he knew Latin. He, must, he may have read directly uh, Aristotle, Plato, Horace in Latin and so on. Um, but he was a great admirer of Ariosto, of Bembo, uh, of Boccaccio. And Jane Whitnall, can you take that on? What else was well, there? Well, he was also very much aware of homegrown models, of which there were, there were, there were numerous. Um, I, I, I have the impression that he was, in, he was, a, he was a voracious and omnivorous reader. Um, among, uh, of course, the book is, is, is a glorious celebration of reading. It's all about reading, about fiction, about readers. Um, and he does have a model, um, well, uh, I was going to say, first of all, of, uh, apart from incorporating all these other genres into his, uh, into his novel, however, we haven't yet dis dis discussed what exactly that is, like the chivalresque romance, the pastoral romance, the picaresque, the epic chronicles and histories, um, the Italian novella, masses of poetry, um, the homegrown drama, and, um, and of course, ballads, as well as, as, as incorporating these wholesale as, as, as versions of, well, his, his versions of these different genres. He also um, has direct, I think, indebtedness to one particular book, one of the ones that is saved from the fire by the priest, who commends it as the best book in the world for style and also for its realism. Uh, a book in which the knights actually eat and sleep and go to bed and, and, and die in their beds. They live in the real world. This is Tiran Lo Blanc, a Catalan novel written um, towards the end of the 15th century in Catalan, but published in Spain in Spanish in 1511, Tiran the White by, by Jeanotte Martorell. Actually, a character who's got a very similar... Um, hi history to Cervantes, also uh, um, something of an adventurer. Anyway, Tiran Lo Blanc is a is a is the bravest and the and the and the most and and the strongest knight in the world. But he's also accident prone, and he dies in his bed. He dies a, a, of an illness. Very uh, he comes to a very pathetic ending. This is, um, in its way, a different way. It's also a spoof romance of chivalry. Is there evidence that uh, the Cervantes sort of plagiarised that to a certain extent? I wouldn't say plagiarised is a safe word to use at all, but he was obviously aware of it. He mentions it at least twice, I think, in Quixot, and it's very similar in the sense that it's also a kind of baggy novel full of different episodes. It's a kind of compendium of works on chivalry, and, and uh, it, it contains treatises, love letters, letters of challenge, and lots of action as well battle scenes, fighting, tournaments, and some very racy sex scenes, which I don't think you get in quick set. <laughs> uh, uh, um, Jane mentioned Baggy, uh, the sort of loose and baggy monster, mm. as it were, and these, the, this is what he inherited, this is what he loved to read, and this is what he was taking on board. Wasn't it? Can you just, just put a fu full stop to that before we move on? Well, there's, uh, uh, as Jane uh, mentioned in passing, there's, uh, there's, there's actually a key episode quite... Uh, close to the beginning of part one when the priest and the barber go through Don Quixote's library and expurgate it and throw a lot of the books onto the, onto the fire and Teravantes names 31 uh, novels in that chapter alone um, some of which survive, some of which don't but they give really a, a good idea of the sort of rich background it's, it's a novel that almost has its own bibliography uh, right at the beginning um, and um, the, the bagginess, I think, comes from two things. One is that it's clear that the Renaissance readers liked variety and they, and they, and they liked a constant changing of, of, of topics and subjects. Um, but I think it also comes from the fact that Cervantes had a, a strong sense of challenge towards the literary past. You know, anything they could do, I can do better. And so he, he, he absolutely relished the challenge of bringing as much as he could of the 120 years or so of novelistic experiment which had gone before him, bringing that into the book. And, you know, without that, Cervantes couldn't have written Don Quixote. It, it, the book couldn't exist without that, that huge background. OK, it's, it's, it's very unfair to ask you to do this, uh, a second brilliant encapsulation, but in our time isn't fair in that sense, <laughs> I mean, at all, not scholars, but can you just give us some 
can you give listeners who, just to bring them up to speed, or just a brief overview of the salient points in the plot and the story, the main characters of the book? Of Tom Quixote? Yeah. Well, I think, may I just preface this by saying that I think we mustn't be too solemn about the romances of chivalry, because in fact they were a very popular genre which captured the Spanish imagination, and that they did have very clear attractions to, to a reader of, different, of all classes, really, um, because you had a, a tale of adventures, you had a love story, you had what would later be called gothic horror, you had magic, um, you had uh, travel in exotic uh, locations. It's, um, and all these appealed to different people. St. Teresa of Avila, in her youth, read the Romance of Chivalry. St. Ignatius of Loyola read the Romance of Chivalry. The Conquistadors read the Romance of Chivalry. Um, in fact, um, the Golden State of the USA got its name from a romance of chivalry. When Cortes finished the conquest of Mexico, he sent some ships up to explore the west coast of his new territory, and they came across this land which reminded them of an episode in um, The Exploits of Esplandian, this romance of chivalry, um, uh, uh, where you have a kingdom of warrior women um, whose queen is called Queen Calafia of California, and that's how California got its name. So it really did entrance the imagination. It's a bit like, for example, saying that um, you, know, you have Harry Potter, uh, James Bond, Lord of the Rings, and Pretty Woman all rolled into one when you're reading these stories. So it's no wonder that um, they, they, they were so popular. By the time Cervantes comes to um, uh, write Don Quixote, the, the genre had run out of steam, but it was still... Quite, it hadn't gone out of fashion. You can see that the uh, ordinary people that you encounter in Don Quixote have read the Romance of Chivalry, uh, are aware of the various characters, uh, Amadis of Gaul and Palmerine of England and so on. So what Cervantes does is he, he has this very brilliant idea. There had been, as Jane has pointed out, burlesque romances of chivalry before. The, the outstanding one, of course, is Ariosto's uh, Orlando Furioso. But Cervantes has an idea which creates a radical break with all the world of chivalry, the uh, chivalric romance. The great poetic world of chivalric romance, which had enthralled all of Europe for several centuries, shrinks and exists nowhere else but in the head of a madman. So when you're reading Don Quixote, you're not inside a world, uh, you're not inside a chivalric romance, uh, you're in 17th century Castile. Chivalric romance exists in Don Quixote's head. So that sets up a very interesting uh, dialectic, an interesting uh, clash, conflict between uh, Don Quixote's uh, chivalric illusions and everyday reality. And I think that's the starting point of the novel. And so we've got, we have Don Quixote, the down at heel gentleman of La Mancha who reads himself into madness and decides to become a knight errant and sets out and adventures to right the wrongs of the world, even though he doesn't really find any wrongs to right. Uh, and the, uh, why did he re in the book, why did he, why did he reinvent himself, Barry Arthur? Is it an act of madness or is it, uh, uh, an act of, uh, uh, does he really think he's, well, I suppose if he really thinks he's going to save the world through, through tilting at windmills, it is a sort of madness. Well, I think the thing to, to bear in mind, and, and, and this is a really quite subtle treatment of the, uh, of the figure is that the, the so-called madness is, is intermittent, it's episodic. I mean, I, I prefer to think of Don Quixote as being eccentric yeah. uh, rather than mad. Um, and uh, Cervantes goes to some lengths in Chapter 1 to diagnose the basis of his illness. You know, basically, he doesn't eat properly, he sits up all night reading, he has no sleep. Uh, and in contemporary terms, the balance of his humours is disturbed. A lot of students listening yeah, to this exactly. will sympathise with exactly. it and wonder if they're on the same track. Yes, yes, I mean, he's a, a classic uh, single male um, problem uh, there. Um, and you know, the fact that he is single and is very heavily signalled, he has no wife, he, ha he lives with a woman who isn't his wife, and, he, uh, and there's a girl in the, in the family that isn't his daughter, so he's, he's dysfunctional socially dysfunctional to that extent, but he has this physiological problem, which is the basis of this ex eccentricity. Um, but it, the eccentricity only really is triggered by sh chivalry. For large parts of the novel, he, he is well-read, uh, he, he, he utters beautifully crafted uh, statements about the classic golden age, yeah. about arms and letters, and so he shows himself to be a very intelligent man. But whenever anybody mentions chivalry, then he flips. 
Jane, can, Jane Whitnall, we have so far avoided talking about Sancho Panza, <laughs> and in the readings I've done for this, uh, for this program, uh, one of you says, or it said somewhere, the masterstroke was after the first six chapters when he came back from unsuccessful jaunts and attempts. He teamed up with Sancho Panza, whom he... Who, who, whom he denoted to be his squire, even though he was much lower class than the squire would be, and so on and so forth. So can you, t and this is, this, is, this is thought of as being a new relationship in literature, these two, can you tell us about why you think it was so important and what, what, what happened between these two men? Um, in a word, uh, it is a dynamic relationship, and it's a classic, I mean, it, 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 it becomes a relationship that we look back on and, and we find there the precursor of, of all sorts of comedy duo pairings that have, have existed since then. Uh, as far as the novel's concerned, I mean, it, it simply represents two polar opposites, the fat man, the thin man, the, the straight guy, the funny guy, the intellectual and the hallucinated one, and the down-to-earth, commonsensical one. Um, and, and this provides a kind of dynamic which allows for... Um, a, all the discussions that that punctuate the episodes, or rather, that, that, that they become a kind of um, mortar linking the episodes, the, the 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 banter between the two as they discuss the reality or otherwise of, of, of yeah. Didn't mean to but we've had two men in Western literature before. They've tended to be uh, almost comparable heroes, or a hero and a shadow hero, oh, a hero yes. and an echo. This is a difference, isn't it? This is a, maybe it's happened, you tell me, it's happened often enough in chivalric literature and so on, but in, in what has become mainstream Western literature, this is the, this is the first appearance of, of two that, such opposites. That, that's true. I, I was, um, yes, so I have, one has to bear in mind that although the master-servant relationship, the master-servant pairing exists prior to Cervantes, that he's taken it, I mean, it, it already had a very well-established um, place <coughs> role on the Golden Age stage, for example, and that goes back to Roman comedy and Plautus and Terrace and people, where there is always a witty and astute servant t attempting to get the better of his master, and that also carries through into the picaresque as well. And there are other and pairings it's a like that. before Cervantes, yeah. I mean, before Cervantes, he's published, never mind, yeah. Probably, well, but then that, that, that's the kind of the stage, yeah. the stage background to it. Yeah. But in terms of, as it were, straight literature, I suppose you normally get a pairing of two, yeah, more or less equals, the yeah. kind of Achilles-Patroclus relationship, or Roland and Oliver, where the hero has a friend who is just not quite so brave, not quite so, you know, so, so, so famous, uh, but who who supports him and whose role is to act as usually a restraining force. I mean, in a way, that, 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 that element also comes in with Sancho constantly trying to deflate um, um, Don Quixote in his, in his aspirations, trying to, constantly trying to needle him and find out um, the truth. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. The other thing is their, as it were, emotional tie, something that grows their relationship throughout the book so that eventually um, what, had what, what, what was once uh, a relationship of self-interest becomes one of mutual dependence and support. Edward. Yes. I would slightly differ mm -hmm. on that because I think another element there is the class difference between oh, um, master and servant. I mean, Don Quixote is a, an Hidalgo. He's a member of the lower gentry. Sancho is a literate uh, country bumpkin. Um, but, of course, once Don Quixote is um, traveling around with Sancho, Don Quixote is trying to transform the world from its humdrum reality into the ideal world of chivalry, and he interprets phenomena. Sancho, of course, uh, tries to uh, tell him that things aren't as he says they, they should be or as he says they are. So you have this constant coming, to and froing between uh, the two versions of reality. Now, that's one big theme. But the social difference, I think, is important because in the course of the development of the narrative, you find that Sancho becomes more self-confident. He starts out not quite knowing what Don Quixote's about, and then gradually he begins to penetrate this strange man's motivation and his temperament and his character. And there comes a point at the beginning of the second part where Sancho learns how to manipulate Don Quixote. So you have the phenomenon um, which has been called the rise of Sancho in part two. And um, the, the bond between them is a complex bond. I think it's more than simply an emotional or fraternal bond. It becomes much more complex. So you do get, in the course of the development of that relationship, you 
do get a sense that these characters are no longer stock types. They are developing uh, along their own, uh, according to their own motivation, according to the particular momentum that the relationship has taken. So I think that's new in, in narrative. Right. There's, a, there's, there's also, in a sense, an economic bond between the two characters because uh, uh, Don Quixote doesn't pay Sancho. He can't pay him. Uh, and so Sancho, uh, and what he does is he promises to reward Sancho uh, with the governorship of an island when uh, he's ultimately successful. So he gives Sancho a stake in his own success. So Sancho is, is tied in irrevocably to, to Quixote, uh, and I think that's the basis, one of the bases on which he gradually espouses Quixote's own visions. Jane Whitnall, can we dig in a little bit more? Uh, Barry, dismi- not dismissive, but slightly put it aside early, replace my w- use of the word madness with his use of the word eccentricity. Can we dig into the, uh, the, the sort of sense of the, the mind uh, of Don Quixote and the illusion and the reality thing, uh, the juxtaposition, which is very powerful and according to, to you, is one of the reasons why the novel is powered through the, the four centuries. Um, would you describe Don Quixote as a madman? Well, actually, I find it difficult to do so now, and it may be something to do with the way, you know, we have come to a greater understanding of, of, of madness, of mental illness. It's obviously not a subject for mockery or mirth anymore. Um, and it's also something that we understand has been kind of commonplace. You know, we're all probably on some sort of spectrum between totally sane and absolutely barking. But, you know, no, but there are very few on the totally sane um, point. I think that there is a there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have reservations about thinking of him as properly mad and even as um, completely innocently eccentric either. I, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm not in agreement with either uh, Barry or <laughs> Jane on this. I think he is mad, and he's mad from start to finish. But he's not uh, mad in the way – this is a literary madness. This is a, a, a literary convenience, in my view. This is only a device that Cervantes invents to parody the romances of chivalry. But I think there are two levels to Don Quixote's madness. I think the primary level is his belief that the romances of chivalry are literally true, that they are true histories. But then there's another level, which is the view that he has been chosen to restore the world of chivalry. Now, he never uh, departs from the view that the romance of chivalry are literally true until his deathbed. So for as long as he believes that, he's mad, I think, barking. Um, But what does vary and what does change and what does allow for character development is uh, his conviction that he has been chosen by destiny, by God, to restore the world of chivalry. You find that, particularly again in part two, that belief uh, begins to wane and you have this curious phenomenon of a madman who is succumbing to growing self-doubt. Can we just, can you briskly, Barry, tell us about two or three of the key incidents and, and keep the theme going of madness? The, the tilting at windmills that everybody knows about, yeah. uh, what that means. The, 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 put, the, the barber's basin, which is thought of as a very rare helmet. Let's, uh, uh, and the sheep is supposed to be an army. Let's, let's get the windmills and the basin uh, onto well, the, the table, as it the, were. The, that, that series starts, really, uh, again in Chapter 1, with the, with the cardboard helmet. Um, uh, his suit of armour is incomplete, so he makes the visor of the helmet out of cardboard. Uh, he then tests it and destroys it, makes it again, and doesn't test it the next time. Now that's <laughs> you know uh, that shows shrewdness. You know he knows that it's going to fail, but he wishes it to be a helmet that will withstand uh, battle. So he 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 starts this process of imposing his will. On, on reality, and the Barber's Basin and the windmills are examples of that. But there's, you know, there's a really, really shrewd logic behind his madness, and that is that you know, two, now 2,000 years of, of, uh, of, of literature and of, of, of uh, moralists have told us that things aren't what they appear to be. You shouldn't judge a, a, a book by its cover. And Quixot applies that principle uh, consistently throughout the book and says... I know it looks like a windmill. I know it looks like a basin, but it's really Mambrina's helmet. And I am a knight. I have the privileged vision. I can see beyond this false exterior, and I can see what it really is. And it's very hard to wrong foot him on that, on that argument. Would um, they have, uh, gentlemen, yeah. or would, would people have, have read it in that way in that day, in uh, 1605? Would, pure, or would they have yeah. just thought, sorry, I'm very yeah. finished, you finish, Barry, and then we'll come to Joe. Oh, as I say, I mean, this is pure Platonism, only, only spoofed in its own way. I and mean, there, there are lots of things that are spoofed in Don Quixote, not just your Rowrick, uh, yeah, but, but philosophy but, as, well, as well. 
Would it, was it seen, are there any evidence that it was seen in the way that Barry Ife's been describing it in its day, or was it thought of more as a, a burlesque, a parody, which he said initially he was uh, setting out to do? The novel itself was obviously seen as a burlesque, yes, I would have thought so. Yeah. I mean, I think we can agree on that. Now, I was thinking more about, uh, to go back to the madness yeah, sure. thing, and, and the sense in which Don Quixote is, con- is in control of his madness, I think is an interesting episode is... Um, when they're in the Sierra Morena and they come face, Sancho and he come face to face with, having, having seen him gambling in the distance, a genuine madman, a genuine madman by the, by in, in terms of what, um, what uh, you know, the, the clinical definition of madness constituted in those days, exactly. namely Cardenio. Cardenio, the character who's first of all introduced as the knight of the ragged mountain or the ragged knight of the mountain, and who's doing these capers because he's, he's, he's in distress about his, his, his uh, unfortunate love affair. It's, it's, uh, the first of all, they see him in the mountain, and then they, um, and then they come across this, this, this treasure that has been abandoned, and Sancho seizes on it and... Um, is delighted to find that finally that there's an adventure that's actually going to produce, produce profit for him. And, and then they come face to face with the man and, and uh, Quixote grabs him by the shoulders and, and, and holds him in a firm embrace. And there's a moment when they look into each other's eyes and the madman stares at him and wonders, have I seen this guy before? And, and Quixote is obviously thinking something like the same thing. But what it's a kind of ep- epiphany. And what proceeds to happen as a result of that encounter is that uh, Quixote, well aware that this is this is a genuine case of madness because they've been talking about it to the goat herds earlier, um, uses him as a role model and proceeds immediately to start doing all the things that Cardenio has been doing, like writing letters and and capering about with no clothes on and things like that. And and uh, so it's as though he, he he's perfectly aware that this this is something that you know he can do this and, and this is obviously what he's supposed to do. Edmund Williamson. Um, we're, we're talking about a book that, that, that's had several different reputations from the beginning. Uh, from the beginning, we, we are told it was a huge success. It was translated very quickly into English and, and, and into other languages. And, um, but it, people look back on it, people like yourselves and, and, and fiction writers and other scholars, as, as extraordinarily interesting technically, for instance, with the idea of the unreliable narrator. So can you give us a, a bit of an idea how this... Uh, uh, how technically interesting it was, because it's not often that technical accomplishment at that very high level or techniques at that level go alongside uh, a, a powerfully popular novel. Well, I think, I think these technical innovations, if you like, arise from the very parody of the Romance of Chivalry. As I said earlier, um, the Romance of Chivalry par- tried to pass themselves off as true history, which is what drove Don Quixote mad. So obviously if you're parodying that, you, you have to make sure that you present your fiction as fiction. So Cervantes has great, makes great play of the uh, differences and similarities between fiction and, and uh, history. Um, for example, in Chapter 9 of Part 1, there's a very curious scene when Don Quix is about to bash a Basque over the head with his sword, and suddenly the action stops. It's almost like a, a videotape running out. And we are told that um, we, the author, who's nameless there, has run out of written sources for the history of Don Quixote. So then um, the second author, the, um, presumably Cervantes, saying that uh, this is a great pity, that um, we can't find any more... Um, uh, sources, and he then, in, Cervantes intrudes himself into the, uh, the novel and describes autobiographically uh, how he'd been walking around the marketplace in Toledo and saw a boy with some parchments, and he buys these parchments and um, uh, takes them to Morisco to translate, and the Morisco starts laughing and uh, um, mentions Dulcinea del Toboso, and then Cervantes says, ah, this might well be uh, the missing uh, history of Don Quixote. So he gets the Morisco, pays Morisco to translate this uh, from the Arabic into Spanish, and it turns out that, uh, indeed, this is another version of the history of Don Quixote written by an Arab historian called Sidi Hamete Benenheli. Now, for a, a Catholic Spaniard of the 17th century, an Arab historian is supremely unreliable. So we have a sense of this history having come down to us in various forms from different sources, some of which are lost, translated into Arabic, then translated back into Spanish by a completely unreliable historian whom we, 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 we um, find begins to introduce his own voice into the narrative and cast doubt on some of the facts that he's relating. So that is one example of the uh, technical 
um, the, the, of the self-consciousness of Don Quixote's sort of book, and the other an important one, I suppose, is the fact that in part two, you find that some Written of the characters... Some years later. Some some y- yes, part two came out in 1615, ten years ten after years part later, one. Yeah. And part one had been a great success, as you say. But you find that in part two, there are some characters who've read part one. And therefore, they can anticipate Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. So Don Quixote and Sancho Panza uh, uh, are vulnerable to manipulation. Can you tell us about Dulcinea, um, Barry, and what part she plays? Well, uh, going back uh, 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 a few steps and to the invention of, of Sancho, Sancho comes in because the, the, uh, the, the innkeeper in, in, in the first sally says, well, you can't be a knight without a squire. Uh, similarly with Dulcinea, she has to come in because she's part of the accoutrements of being a, a, a knight. And it, it's, it's, a, it's an image, it's, a, it's an ideal, and he projects it onto a particular person who he's seen once or twice, who happens to live in, in a nearby village of uh, uh, El Toboso. But this becomes the driving fantasy of, uh, of his whole uh, journey and, 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 and his whole purpose in life. She never really. actually appears. But she it? never appears, no. no. I mean, she doesn't in 1,200 exist. pages. Absolutely not, no. But he's constantly referred to. Uh, and I think it's another example of the way in which his, you know, his will will to live out this fantasy and to and, and, and to participate in all of aspects of it uh, is imposed on on the reality around him. Jane Mcnall is one of the reasons why he was translated so swiftly and again and, and so frequently because of the accessibility of his language. I mean, people wanted to read the story, wanted to read him, but was his language thought to be very accessible at the time? Uh, at, at the time, I don't know, but now it is, which which is well, which says an awful lot. I mean, sixteen oh five there, sixteen oh eight there was a copy in the Bodleian, and then there was the translations of the second book soon after that. I mean, that's getting a move on, even yeah. by modern standards. Well, by by those standards, it, it had all the ingredients of an yeah. international bestseller. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 and the language is certainly one of the things that recommends itself to readers today, because even today you, you read Cervantes and you're not really aware you're reading a book that was written at the beginning of the 17th century. It's much more accessible, much more transparent than Shakespeare. I mean, nowadays our, our, you know, our, our students are having trouble with Shakespeare and he's obviously going to get more difficult as time goes on. Sure. Cervantes mm. seems to have hit... No? no, I, was just, no I, I don't know about it. I was just going to be a, a grump about it, but never no, mind. I'll pass. Yeah, well, I would no, 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 pass, no, pass, pass, pass. No, <laughs> let's stick to Cervantes. Cervantes. Uh, and Cervantes so is he is using a particular form of, of, of vernacular Spanish of the time? Has he he's chosen using, to do that? He's used masses of different registers, but I'm thinking about the frame narrative and the, and the, and the conversations with Sancho. But, uh, th- these are all in, in a Spanish that is recognisably just classic, really. It's a very eloquent book. Uh, Cervantes gives Don Quixote wonderful things to say, beautifully written. Um, in, in, in many for for page after, after page. Well, there's a there's a wonderful um, uh, passage at the end of the first interpolated novel of uh, Grisasmo Marcela, where um, Quixote is incredibly uh, um, uh, eloquent. Um, many other uh, uh, occasions, you know, when he's talking about the ideals of chivalry, he has you know, wonderfully classical things to say. He has these two big discourses in part one, one on the Golden Age and one on arms and letters, uh, which are uh, compilations of uh, classical wisdom. Um, and so eloquence is really very important because it's a novel in which people talk all the time. We were talking about narrators earlier, actually, for, for huge tracts of the novel. The narrator virtually disappears. He delegates the task of telling the story to the characters. Quixot and Sancho spend page after page after page talking to each other, and all the narrator says is, he said, she, you know, he, he replied. So um, it, we, it, that, I think that's part of the root of the sort of limpidity of, of the book, the transparency and the clarity of it, and that's why I think it is incredibly accessible even today. Adrian Williamson, I'm oh, sorry, you're about to uh, come in anyway. I think, uh, <laughs> there, are di- there are different uh, voices too, and uh, I think part of the, it's a very funny book, I think that explains a lot of its popularity. It makes you laugh, and there's comedy of character, comedy of situation, but also comedy of language, and the clashes between this wonderful eloquence of John Quixote, which he's capable of, Sancho's rustic speech, and uh, the, 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 the rough speech speech of other characters. I think that's an important part of the comedy. What essentially, uh, we're coming towards the end of the programme now, but what essentially was there about this novel which made very, very great writers afterwards until today want to take from it 
use it, uh, absorb it, and be part of what he set up. What would you say, Edwin? Well, I think that clash between Don Quixote's mad illusions and reality introduces the principle of realism into European literature. Um, from now on, you have a uh, sense in which you're depicting a, so- a credible social reality. But more than that, I think um, the Quixot idea of a character who has ideals or illusions, which he, ha- he or she has gradually to adjust to ex- a lived experience, is perhaps the fundamental driving force of the novel, if you think of any novel. Um, It really is about a a man or a woman or men and women who actually have to adjust their own aspirations to to reality, to their experience. But in addition to that, you have these uh, quick substantial relationship, and that, I think, shows again for the first time that the novel will center on relationships between characters, between individuals, and that becomes a focus of interest in its own right. You get the sense of these characters being individuals and not conforming to some... Uh, conventional type uh, so there is that dialogue you've also got the uh, the narrator the voice of the narrator which is a breezy ironic comic voice which is what attracted Henry Fielding so much and Lauren Stern uh, talking about Lauren Stern I think the self-consciousness the literary self-consciousness and the literary play that also is very appealing to, to novelists you have anything to add to that, Joan? I was going to say just only uh, the, the, w- one thing that was picked up a lot by later novelists was the strain of, of the dangers of reading, often used ironically after, after Quixote, but it, it, it appears in all the um, English 18th century writers, novelists and dramatists and Sheridan, people like that. I, I agree, agree with all of that, but uh, I think we shouldn't underestimate the technical uh, innovation of, of the work. I mean, it is phenomenally cleverly uh, put together. It feels loose and baggy, but it's extremely well uh, put together. Uh, all the episodes are, are, are interestingly sewn in. And in part two, he introduces this, this wonderful switch of making Don Quixote famous, whereas in part one he'd been uh, a nobody. Um, uh, incorporating part one into part two, I think, is a masterstroke. Well, thank you all very much, uh, Barry Ive, Jane Wetnall, and Edwin Williamson. Uh, next week we'll be talking about the origins of the Royal Society, again in the 17th century, but here rather than in Spain. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.